two offers on a $10 million plus dollar deal, one for $10 million, one for $11.15 million. He's also trying to sell another deal for $12 million, and they're interested in doing a 1031 exchange, and he's also got another deal for possibly $13 million. Cole just said closed on a deal that was under contract for nine plus months, trying to lock up a six-unit deal in northern New Jersey for a 15-day close. Love it. Rodolfo saying, started my new company just about five weeks ago, has seven new clients, three of which are already making offers. We'd love to hear it. Logan says, saved a deal after under appraising by 28 grand. Jeez. And also down 85 pounds since the beginning of the year. Trevor says, has two deals that should be under contract this week. Love to hear that. So I'm going to uh, look at this property with the, with the buyer. The listing agent said that the tenants pay cash and have been paying cash, like their rent in cash, like for, for a very long time. How would that affect the underwriting as long as they have proof We're, bank receipts mm -hmm. right bank statements that they can show that the property has been earning income and that it's been every month the rent has been paid what kind of building is it by the way mixed use it's actually one tenant he's got a restaurant on the first floor and two apartments on on the second floor but it's all one tenant and it's, it's all been cash yeah i mean as long as he's got a show record of it you always try to tell people i'm like listen like this isn't this isn't 19 42 or you know 1956 where you could get away with paying things in cash and people just believe you right mm -hmm. a bank's not going to lend money on you just collecting cash and never depositing it in the bank i would highly recommend that if they really want to sell for top dollar they need to start start if they're not showing it they need to start showing it uh and if they have been showing it that's that's fine they, they can pay okay. cash i don't care how they pay they could sell it they could pay cash they could do checks i don't my tenants do all of the above Right. But I got to mm -hmm. still show the, you know, I got to still show the, um, the banks what I'm earning. Right. So the, um, lender would pretty much just need proof that rent was received in some, some sort of way. Okay. All right. Got it. Thank you. Question regarding NDA agreements. Is it something simply to protect yourself from people going around you directly to the seller? Or can, or can you face repercussions for sharing something that you should have had an NDA agreement signed for, but you didn't? Technically both. If you want the legal answer, it's both. If you want okay. just me talking to you straight, um, I look at it like this. I ask sellers their offer, like what they would like. And I like to, anytime you ask, like, would you like us to get an NDA signed? Or they don't, or they just don't care. Typically the larger the deal and the higher quality the tenant, the more likely they are that they would like you to sign an NDA. Like I'll give you an example. Like if you're dealing with an eight or 10 unit multifamily, there's really nothing that they're gonna say or do that would require an NDA for anything like that. Unless you're quote, like putting a, a deal on Crexy, right? Like I'll give you an example of where it like gets you really screwed up. You speak to a 10 unit owner, owner says, I wanna sell, you say, okay. Uh, cool, get all their information, and then you take their information and then post it somewhere, right? You post it on Facebook, you post it on Craxy, you post it on LoopNet without their permission, and you start posting the information out there. All of a sudden, then they see it, and they see that it's being marketed, right? Now, now that's not just an NDA, but that is one thing that, like, of course, you could, like, that's also going to, you know, like, exclusive right to sell and other things. Like, there's other corresponding documents that would need to be signed in order to do so. That's where you start crossing the line where you might okay. have those issues, right? However, bigger thing is with the bigger tenants, like, you know, uh, uh, one of our agents is working on a Wawa deal, big portfolio of Wawa's. This guy does not want to share any information, how much Wawa is paying, the addresses, any of it, unless he gets a, an NDA signed and signed by that buyer, not just the broker, because he wants to make sure that this individual is not going to just go around talking to then competitors or Wawa about the situation. Uh, just They want to be protected. The owners really want to be the ones who are protected, right? Because if it comes back around to Wawa and then all of a sudden this random guy is like, hey, this guy's you know sharing your rent, your rent rates all, all over the place, it just is not a good look. So I'd say with really small deals, you know, the, the smaller the deals, like the sub $2 million deals, it's rare that you're really going to ever need an NDA. Much bigger deals, again, with national tenants, you know, bigger time tenants, bigger bigger investment deals, they're probably going to want an NDA. And I would imagine it'd be smart to sign an NDA. Thanks, because I'm working on a, I mean, I'm not working, but I, I have access to a, a 394 unit in uh, in Springfield, Massachusetts. I had emailed it over. I'm not sure if you saw it yet. That I'd love some feedback on, but... But again, I'm, that's the only reason I ask. I'm not sure if it's something, you know, I, I wasn't sure how important it was or, or what the, what the backlash can be. Yeah. It, it depends on the seller. 
It really depends. Yeah. On you know, people call me up on my properties. They'll be like, they'll ask me questions and I don't really care. I'll give them all the information because I, who, what are you going to do with more information about my properties? I, I, it doesn't bother me. But at the same time, you know, if you're talking to a guy who owns 15,000 apartments and you randomly call him up about a 400 unit deal that he has, you know, he's got investors that he's got to make right on. He might not want you blasting this deal everywhere. So they have more to lose. When you have more to lose, you want to protect yourself. Got it. Cool. Thank you. And like, keep in mind, guys, that like, I'm the kind of person because we don't list anything. Like, we, we purposely do not take a lot of listings on purpose um, a lot of the time, right? Like, it's like, it's our last resort, right? Like, we do, we're not someone who actively pushes, like, trying to list properties for sale, you know, unless a seller is incredibly adamant that they would like an extremely high number and we can't achieve it on our own. So we don't get a lot of these documents signed. We don't get exclusive signed. We don't get NDA signed a lot of the time. Like obviously if it's re if they request it, of course we're going to do it. We're gonna abide by whatever the seller wants. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying like our general business practice is not to try to pitch a listing and get an exclusive sign to try to sell a deal, though it does happen on occasion. That being said, you know, a lot of people are like, what if somebody goes around you? Like, look, even if you had an exclusive sign, let me explain this, okay? Let's say you have a $10 million deal and you sign an exclusive. The seller says, look, uh, I want, you know, you can find, you can list my property. I'll give you the exclusive of my property. I don't want to list it for sale. They give you the exclusive. You now try to pitch that property out, pitch the property out, pitch the property out. You get NDA signed by buyers who are possibly interested in the deal. Now, let's just say three or four months goes by, you don't sell the deal. You still have an exclusive and then in the meantime, some random uh, buyer goes to your seller and tries to buy it directly. Now they're on your email list. You never spoke to them. They're on your email list. They got an email. They never opened your email. Okay, but they happen to be friends with this random um, this random owner and they called them up and they said, hey, I'm interested in buying your property. They buy the property. They never signed an NDA, but you do have an exclusive sign saying that you'd be paid. Now here's the thing. You could fight them. You could fight the seller. Maybe if they were, let's just say they want to argue with you and they don't want to try to pay your commission. The exclusive, you could take them to court and you could play the whole game. You could play the game. And they could try to claim that, that it's their friend, their cousin, their family, whatever they're going to try to say. Okay? Try to give you an extreme, extreme answer. Your brokerage might try to fight them. And they might pay tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars to try to get their commission check that they're in technically or rightfully owed in, in regard, unless it was written in the paper. Now the question is, okay, that's a $10 million deal and maybe you wrote that you're gonna get paid 4%, 5%, you're gonna try to fight for a couple hundred thousand bucks, I can understand that. Now, let's say it's a million dollar deal. Same situation, you sign it for 3% commission, right? Maybe 4% commission. And the same exact circumstances happen. Are you gonna spend 35,000 bucks to try to win 40? I don't know if that really matters. You know what I mean? Like th this is why like people sign documents, right? Like, cause they want to be able to fight it if people try to go around them. So it's like, okay, the amount of times in my entire career that people have gone around me has been less than I can count on one hand, okay? So I never really care about signing exclusives because listen, if you're gonna screw me once, I'll never send you a deal ever again. And it's like, think about it. If you're an investor on my list and my, and my team comes across hundreds of opportunities every single month and will continue to generate hundreds, if not more opportunities every single month in the future, right, of good opportunities, why on planet earth would you want to screw me over one one deal? It makes no sense, right? You better make, set, you know, my, hopefully you make five or $10 million in the time you screw me because you'll be the last time we ever do business together, right? In my eyes, I just don't think it makes it, like, it's like, I don't care. I don't care about the end. I don't like, you know, it's not something that I bring up that I push all the time of signing exclusives and signing NDAs and whatever. A lot of big corporate companies will push you to do that because they're willing to fight a battle. They're willing to go to court and fight for commissions. I'm at the end of the day, like, I'm not gonna, my company might, but I'm not going to give a shit. I don't really care, right? If you're going to screw me, screw me. Like, you know, that's just what it is. Like, you know, I just bet on that there's enough good people out there who want to actually build a relationship. And that's been the case. Like I said, I've been screwed a few times, but maybe, you know, two or three times in my entire career that someone's actually gone around me. So I don't think it's a huge risk because think about the, the, this is the last thing I'm going to say on this. You have a seller who goes, I don't want to sign anything. Both, okay. And this is the broker's responses. You have corporate company number one who goes, corporate company goes, I'm not going to work on your property unless you sign this exclusive listing. And they push for an exclusive. They push for all the documents to be signed and the seller is very against it. And then what happens is you burn a bridge or you now spend weeks trying to get them to sign something before you even start the deal. Option number two, which is what I do, you speak to the seller. They say they don't want to sign anything. I go, okay, no problem. Is it okay if I put it in front of a few of my best buyers and try to see if I can get you a good offer? They say yes. 
I go, okay, great. Before I even go out to those buyers, actually, I'll present an offer right away of X price. I'll get a counter from that person. And then within 24 to 48 hours later, I'll have another three or four or five offers from more buyers that I'll present right away, right? And I'll present all those offers within a 48 hour to 96 hour, you know, what is it? Yeah, a 96 hour period of time, call it a few days, right? Within a week, all of a sudden, within a week, I've gotten three or four or five offers on the same property and we're moving things along and hopefully getting things, you know, uh, agreed upon towards a contract and then per, you know, back to corporate company A, right? They haven't even signed an exclusive yet and it might be a few weeks until they sign an exclusive and then they have to get all the documents and then they wanna go take pictures and they wanna do the all the corporate bullshit. I'm like, I just saved you weeks in the transaction and I'm already moving forward on the deal. So that's why we, we do this process the way we do it and you know we don't wanna waste time because time kills all the deals.